So far, we have discovered together how the fear of the Lord is good. It endures forever, and it causes us to hate evil and love good. So Jesus promoted the fear of the Lord, just as all of his servants, the apostles and prophets did. We have learned that many Christians are not being taught that the fear of the Lord is good. So many famous people associated with the name of our Lord have demonstrated they did not fear the Lord through their evil actions. We have learned that we can focus our fear on the wrong things, which will cause us to lose sight of the fear of the Lord. And when fear is misplaced, instead of loving what God calls good and hating what God calls evil, people focus their fear on things that cannot lead to the eternal condemnation of their souls. We have learned that salvation is a road and the fear of the Lord repels us away from evil, while the love of God draws us forward towards good. But when we forget the fear of the Lord, misplaced love will lead to an exit off the road of salvation, and we will be right back on the evil mega highway that leads to destruction unless we repent. We have learned that God's law functions like a guardrail along the road of salvation, helping us define the edges of the road by defining good and evil. And the fear of the Lord works like an exit-closed sign to prevent us from taking an exit ramp towards sin. But false prophets and false teachers dismantle the divinely designed guardrails and exit-closed signs thereby leading people off the road of salvation. So we must avoid anyone who contradicts the fear of the Lord or God's standards of good and evil. We have learned that the law is good. We should obey it in the fear of the Lord. And the law is instituted to protect every law-abiding citizen from those who would break the law. Thus, the liberties all law-abiding citizens enjoy can only exist in a society with just laws and trustworthy law enforcement officials. We have proven that any law enforcement officer who refuses to stop those who violate the law or treat all those they do stop impartially is not a good law enforcement officer. Likewise, we have proven that a judge who refuses to punish all those who violate the law impartially is not a good judge. But most importantly, we learn together that Jesus is the lawgiver, the judge, and the lamb. And those three titles of our Lord do not contradict one another. However, people who only see Jesus as the Lamb and their Savior often abandon the fear of the Lord and obedience to his commandments. Thus, with all we have learned together established as a foundation, we are ready to build on that biblical footing and see how the truth about the fear of the Lord requires us to remember that Jesus is the impartial judge of all the earth. His standards of judgment are absolute, and his cross does not contradict those facts. Please imagine someone pulled over by a police officer for speeding. But when questioned by the officer, they point out that they were looking for a speed limit sign to obey, but because they could not find that sign, and they don't normally drive that road, they did not know what the speed limit was. The officer then has a choice to make. First of all, ignorance of the law is not an excuse, so he might present them with a ticket for speeding. But if the law allows for it, the officer might decide to present them with an official warning and advise them to go and speed no more. Now imagine that the officer desired to be perfectly just, and for some reason 
Warnings were not permitted in his district. What if he issued the unintentional speeder a ticket and then personally paid the fines? Would his actions undermine the speed limit laws he was sworn to uphold? Or would they reinforce and support those laws? Would an officer paying someone speeding fines erase the speed limit? Certainly not. Instead, it would show the driver that the officer deeply cared for them, but he had the highest respect for the law that demanded such a penalty. Therefore, this should cause the person whose fine was paid to drive under the speed limit happily and consistently from then on. What if we transfer this analogy to a judge? Imagine someone standing before a judge for a crime they committed in ignorance. Somehow, they broke a law they had never heard of, and the prescribed punishment was a month in jail. If the judge decided to let that person go with a warning, and afterward went to serve the month in jail on their behalf, so that the law was satisfied, would it abolish that law or reinforce it? You see, only if the judge truly cared for the person who broke the law and simultaneously held the law in the highest regard would they act in such a gracious way. And the lesson that the judge's actions should teach the person who unintentionally violated the law is how seriously they should avoid breaking the law ever again. Friends, that is what the cross of Jesus declares. Jesus is the ultimate judge, but he stepped down from heaven's throne to die for our sins so that we would realize two very important things. First, we must realize the amazing love Jesus demonstrated by dying for us while we were yet sinners, a term that means we violated his perfect laws. And second, we must realize how seriously Jesus takes his law to willingly take on the prescribed penalty for all those who will repent and come to him as their teacher and Lord. This is why Paul wrote, Jesus Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem or buy us back from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. The gracious police officer and the gracious judge both showed grace in our analogies to teach the recipient of that grace to obey the law and this was the point of our Lord's ultimate sacrifice of grace. He wants us to do good, as defined by his law, and to avoid evil. So, all those who understand the biblical gospel can see, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us, that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. But those who misunderstand the gospel of God's grace think that Jesus abolished the laws that they broke rather than the record of them breaking the law. Would you pay a prescribed penalty for someone else? if you thought you could just abolish the law that established the penalty? Certainly not. So, the death of our Lord on the cross proves that Jesus did not abolish the law. For this reason Jesus commanded, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fill them to the full. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one iota or one dot will by no means pass from the law till all has come to pass. Whoever therefore loosens 
one of the least of these commandments, and teaches men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commandments, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Truly, Jesus did not abolish his law, and he forbids us to even think that he did. Instead, Jesus simply replaced the Levitical system of cleansing that he instituted before his death to usher in a new and better priesthood based on his ultimate sacrifice. So the book of Hebrews perfectly summarizes what legal aspects Jesus did away with at his cross, explaining that the Levitical priesthood was concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances, imposed until the time of Reformation. But Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Hebrews explains the Levitical priesthood with those fleshly ordinances could not open the veil to the Holy of Holies. But Jesus succeeded in opening that veil when he became our high priest. And that fact eliminated the fleshly aspects of the first covenant imposed when the veil was shut, such as the laws concerning clean and unclean foods, the ritual washing of unclean items, and fleshly ordinances like physical circumcision. Meanwhile, the new covenant that features Jesus as high priest is still based on the same commandments, and no part of his law was abolished beyond those fleshly items. So Paul wrote, Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Yes, the amazing grace of God is not in any way opposed to God's amazing commandments or the fear of the Lord. And anyone who teaches otherwise is teaching a false gospel. They are not abiding in the doctrine of Christ, and Paul has placed a curse on them within the pages of the Bible. Paul wrote, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you, in the grace of Christ, to a different gospel. Which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have already preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Some people teach a false gospel by proclaiming that Christians must keep the foods, drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances of the Levitical covenant. And Paul's curse definitely applies to them. But other people teach that Jesus did away with some or all of the commandments of God and the good moral standards they represent. And those who teach this heresy are also under Paul's curse. But the ironic thing is, those who teach that second false doctrine do so because they misunderstand the letters of Paul, the apostle who cursed them in one of his letters. As a former Pharisee, who relied on the foods, drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances of the law for his righteousness, Paul knew how these things never made anyone righteous enough to enter the Holy of Holies. So because Paul knew they represented the old covenant of Levitical works, Paul vehemently opposed them. 
For this reason, when you read in any of Paul's letters an argument against what he called the works of the law, you will see Paul mention circumcision or foods in the context of such passages. But at the same time, Paul always promoted good works that agreed with the moral aspects of the law not related to Levitical cleansing. As a few examples of many, we see that Paul wrote, This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. Paul wrote, God will recompense each person according to his works, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. And Paul testified that everywhere he went he taught all of the people he met that they must repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. So it is true that Paul taught against the works of the law, such as circumcision and Levitical dietary restrictions, but Paul never taught against the commandments of God or the fear of the Lord. For this reason, we see Paul keeping Sabbath each week, observing the feasts of the Lord, and writing to the churches about those feasts, expelling blasphemers out of congregations, commanding churches to expel sexually immoral people, commanding us to put away lying and stealing, teaching that covetousness was idolatry, and much, much more. Yes, Paul was reinforcing the commandments and the fear of the Lord when he wrote the following. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Paul likewise was emphasizing the commandments in the fear of the Lord when he warned, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And we can be sure that Paul was teaching the fear of the Lord and the commandments of God when he explained, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. But when people who don't know or understand the rest of the Bible read Paul's letters and how Paul opposed certain works of the law like circumcision or Levitical regulations regarding foods, those without a solid biblical foundation twist Paul's words to their own destruction. But God knew this would occur. So God had his servant Peter 
leave us all a very special warning. In the very last words Peter wrote to the church, he included this warning as he wrote, Our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. Within the Bible's inspired pages, there is a warning that indicates we should never base our entire understanding of God's law exclusively on Paul's letters. Because Paul's writings contain some things that are hard for even apostles like Peter to understand. Consequently, untaught and unstable people twist Paul's letters to their own destruction. And when Peter issued this warning, he cautioned us of a very specific heresy to avoid when he wrote about the error of the wicked. The word Peter used that we translate as wicked was a thesmos, which, according to Thayer's Greek lexicon, means one who breaks through the restraint of law and gratifies his lusts. Yes, nearly 2,000 years ago, Peter warned that some untaught, unstable people use Paul's letters to justify breaking through the restraint of God's law to gratify their lusts. So we must always remember that Paul was a disciple of Jesus Christ. He would never contradict Jesus or the doctrine of his appointed apostles. No, Paul agreed with Jesus and his apostles about the eternal nature of the commandments of God and the fear of the Lord, and if someone thinks Paul was contradicting those principles or Jesus who taught them to us, they better study the word of God much harder. Now, with that debate out of the way, let us move on to learn about a very important doctrine that the scriptures teach, and that is the doctrine of worthiness. John is clear about the worthiness of God saying about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength and honor, and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor, and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Truly, all of heaven and earth know God is worthy to reign over all the universe because God created it. He is worthy of all the riches that exist because he created all things. He is worthy to receive glory from all of his creation because he sustains every creature. 
He is worthy to receive worship because he is holy and perfectly pure, and he is worthy of every other good thing, since all good things come from our heavenly king, and God is good in every facet of his glorious being. But why should we fear our wonderful, awesome, exalted God? Well, the answer is a question of worthiness, because we don't always live up to his standards of good. Without the sacrifice of Jesus, friends, no one is worthy to enter the kingdom of God. Because all people have sinned, which is the breaking of God's commandments. But God instituted a sacrificial system and a priesthood in the first covenant to teach us how to understand what Jesus did for us on the cross. Jesus became our high priest, our sacrifice, and our Savior, so that the sins of all who repent and turn to him in obedient faith could be forgiven and worthiness could be restored by God's grace. According to the righteous judgment of God, we were worthy of the punishment of death. But Jesus took that punishment upon himself so that we could have eternal life. And because Jesus was a perfect, worthy, sinless sacrifice, the grave could not keep him. Or, put in terms of our traffic ticket analogy, our lawless driving made us unworthy to drive anymore. But it's like Jesus deposited an infinite amount of money in a very special bank account set apart to pay the fines of all those who will agree with his traffic laws and ask him to forgive them for speeding while inviting him to teach them how to obey the rules of the road going forward. So by his gift, he can make drivers that are worthy of the road. Or put in terms of our judge analogy, our violations of the law made us worthy of imprisonment. But it's like Jesus spent an infinite number of years in prison to erase the sentence of all who will repent of their violating his law, who will ask him to help them be good law-abiding citizens. So those who accept his offer can become worthy of his eternal kingdom. But after we understand the relationship the cross of Jesus has to true justice and his commandments, and how Jesus can make sinners who are worthy of death saints who are worthy of eternal life, we need to understand that is not the end of the gospel. No, after Jesus purchased our freedom from sin's condemnation, Jesus rose again from the grave and returned to his glorious throne in heaven. Therefore, the gospel that the apostles preached did not end with the death of Jesus Christ. No, it always includes the fact that the resurrection proved Jesus is worthy to judge the entire earth. He has the keys to death and Hades. Therefore, he will return to judge the world impartially based on each one's works to measure if they are worthy of his kingdom or worthy of eternal punishment. Peter explained that the Lord specifically commanded that the gospel include Jesus as judge. So Peter declared, He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. Jesus commanded that his role as judge be part of the gospel, so no one would think the gospel contradicted the fear of the Lord. Therefore, the doctrine of the fear of the Lord always sets our focus on Jesus, as the ultimate judge. And those who remember that Jesus is the judge always seek to conduct themselves in a way that Jesus would consider worthy of his sacrifice. 
if we stumble into sin, we must repent, just as we did when we first came to Jesus, and his blood will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But every Christian must admit and understand there is a big difference between stumbling into something you don't want to do and repeatedly doing what you hope to get away with. Repentance means we don't want to sin anymore. We agree with Jesus that sin is evil, harmful, selfish, unloving, and destructive. And those who truly repent agree with Jesus and his apostles that the law is good. Those who only pray to Jesus to forgive them so that they can avoid hell have not truly repented and agreed with the Lord's teachings that the law is good and they should keep it. And this is made evident by the fact that they never live in the freedom from sin that Jesus purchased for them. But those true Christians who find freedom from sin's slavery, come to Jesus because they see that sin is wrong. They know hell is a just punishment for sin, and they don't want to sin anymore. Therefore, Jesus will apply his blood to their sins, fill them with his Holy Spirit, and teach them how to walk in the way of righteousness in a manner worthy of his great sacrifice. Truly, God's grace that makes it possible to have our sins forgiven by the blood of Jesus is an invitation to turn to God and live under his authority because we have recognized that his rules are worthy of obedience, his ways are worthy of imitating, and the things we thought sin could offer us turned out to be unworthy deceptions that always end in death. And those who fully understand what the Bible teaches about God's law, his grace, and the gospel can see how this next passage fits perfectly with all we have learned so far. Jesus commanded, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. The Greek verb Jesus used, which was translated here as counted worthy, is katax eoo, but it does not mean counted worthy. It means judged worthy. And the Greek word worthy that the compound verb Jesus used is based on is axios, which means having the weight of another thing. So when you read the term worthy in the Bible, think of a set of scales as typically pictured with a book and a gavel as a representation of the justice system. The book represents the law. The scales represent an accurate evaluation of a person's actions when weighed against the law. And the gavel represents the judgment. A just judge pronounces, based on weighing the actions of those they are judging against, the righteous requirements of the law. For example, Paul used the adverb form of that word, to refer to weighing two things on a scale when he wrote, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And Paul used the same form when he wrote, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you, may be filled with all the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. 
Likewise, Paul used the adverb form of the Greek word for worthy, which refers to weighing two items on a set of scales as he wrote. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Meanwhile, Jesus used the adjective form of the word when he warned, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. All of these passages and more speak about worthiness using the word axios as their root. So each of these passages, in one way or another, is referring to how Jesus will judge us all impartially, based on our works. Ananias and Sapphira plotted together to lie to the Holy Spirit, and Jesus weighed their actions against his law and judged that their sin was worthy of death. His judgment was instantly applied to those two believers in that particular case to show all of his church what he declared once more in the book of Revelation. He said to the church of Thyatira, I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, but she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their works. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Jesus wants all his churches to know that he will judge us by our works. If we have repented and received the remission of sins he offers through his cross, we can enter the narrow gate and begin our journey on the highway of salvation. If we take an exit off of that blessed road, we can repent and return to the highway by the power of his blood. However, if we keep on violating his commandments, when the day of judgment comes, Jesus will weigh us against the eternal standards of his law, and we will be found unworthy of his kingdom. That is the terms of the covenant, and without his grace, no one could ever be counted worthy. However, his grace does not give us a license to sin. Instead, it instructs us to stop sinning, lest something terrible happen to us. So we see the harmony between the fear of the Lord, the doctrine of worthiness, God's law, God's grace, and the everlasting gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we read in the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie.